speaker is Madhu Chopra. I believe uh, the lineage from which Madhu comes did not pass through Baroda. But the organizers of this panel thought that Madhu would be an important contributor to this panel and therefore she is here by very special invitation. She is going to speak to us about issues of dating and intergenerational relationships. So it just as well that her parents are not here. CLA in biology and is currently a second year medical student at UCLA School of Medicine. Welcome, Madhu. dating so I wanted to start off with something when I heard it um, and there was a publication um, called India West that maybe many of you are familiar with and there was a rap song that they had there um, which was for their youth awards night and I think it it sums up a lot what's going on a lot of what's going on um, for what you call like your ABCD which is your American born confused they see. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so now here's the rap, it's just for the youth to get what they want, they'll fight meal and two. Their roots and ancestry you may go back to India, but their home, you see, is now in America. They talk like Yanks, though their skin may be brown. On the accents of their appearance, they often frown. A problem in school brings mom in a hurry, but mom, when you come, please don't worry, sorry. Hot dogs, hamburgers, fries, and a shake. But mom's ball roti, I will not take. It's okay for parents to want the best, but getting straight A's is not the only test. Music that you like is by Shankar Jagkishan, but we'd rather hear Janet Jackson. <laughs> we'll go to your parties and wear a smile, but please, before the next one, can we wait a while? <laughs> Movies from India we generally shun, unless it's one starring Amita Bachchan. <laughs> Our moms at parties are demure and shy, but why take so long to say goodbye? Dad, oh dad, may I please go out on a date? Yes, dear son, but don't be out too late. Mom, dear mom, may I please go out on a date? Sorry, dear daughter, but such is not your fate. Um, this rap song actually raises a large number of issues that Indian children deal with when growing up in the United States, but I'd actually like to focus on um, the topic of dating. Um, first and foremost, I think we can address the apprehension that most of our parents or the first generation um, feel towards the idea of their children dating. Um, I think the apprehension is, is understandable since most parents here probably had arranged marriages. So the whole idea of, of dating to find your spouse is, is totally foreign to them. The uh, responsibility of finding the suitable match was given to your parents, so you never were even concerned about meeting someone on your own in most cases. Um, so basically that's one point of frustration for us is that dating is a new and foreign concept for our parents. Um, another point of conflict, which I guess the rap alluded, was the issue of gender bias. Um, this issue, however, frustrates women of all ethnicities, not just Indian women. Um, essentially, parents of all cultures recognize that their daughters can get pregnant, but their sons cannot. Um, however, there are a number of issues um, which make the Indian community stand out when it comes to gender bias. Whereas in most non-Indian families, girls tend to have the same curfew as um, their brothers, for example. Indian girls have markedly different curfews um, than their brothers. It's, it's often common to hear a parent, an Indian parent telling their daughter, okay, well, be home by 10, then, you know, be good. But, uh, but telling their son, basically, you know, like, hey, Ruth, Rohit, come, come home whenever you want, <laughs> basically, or whenever you think is a good idea. Um, another issue which comes up is also um, the desire for Indian women of basically marriageable age to be very pure, and I almost go as far as saying Sita-like. Um, this, of course, is, is not really a prerequisite for women in most non-Indian communities. Um, another issue um, that we have dating is, is reputation. Um, Indian parents naturally want their children to, have, to maintain a really pristine reputation. Everyone wants their children to be considered um, very smart, well-mannered, respectful of their elders, and um, I, I'm sure there's not one Indian mom in this audience that wants to tell her, Sahelia, that her daughter's dated three guys in the last month or something like that. 
um, I mean, what are they going to think? What, what are your friends going to think? You know, what's going to happen to your daughter's reputation? Um, the other side of this argument is that um, most of the second generation tends to want to find their own spouse and, and don't really care what their mom say and Mia think. Um, and of course, if, if you're not interested in, in having someone else shopping for you, like, like in many of the first generation's case, their parents, um, then you're going to have to meet people on the I can see why Madhu was a special guest, invited specially here by her colleagues, so she can share what some of you may not want to come up here and share. Rajan, who is our next speaker, also reminded that during the discussion, it is possible that you may not wish to ask a question that may otherwise seem provocative by standing up. You are most welcome to pass on those written questions to me, I'd be very happy to read them and present them to these young panelists. I have two uh, other announcements before we go on to our next speaker. Let me check again if Shetam Bhagat is in the audience. She's still not here. She was going to be. Are you there? No. <laughs> uh, Akshay Desai one of these honorable mentions that I said at the very beginning, son of Suvas and Nima Desai, who is a Rhodes Scholar and graduated from Princeton and a Master's in Philosophy from Oxford College in England. He's currently doing a residency at Mass General Hospital. Congratulations, Akshay. He's probably not here, but I'm sure the parents will pass on our greetings to him. Sujata Parai, daughter of Panna and Bharat Parai, is going to college at Princeton University as well. She has been admitted to Woodrow Wilson College of Public Policy. At this time, she's working in the White House doing research in domestic policy and she intends to pursue higher studies in law. Congratulations, Sujata. <laughs> Failing Shetal Bhagat's sudden appearance at this gathering, uh, Rajan Bhatt is our next speaker, and he too is going to speak about the choice of marital partner. Rajan is son of Dilip and Harshida Bhatt. He too is in his 20s, like the other pan panelists, and graduated from University of California at San Diego with a degree in biochemistry. And biology? Two majors? <laughs> or something like that. Currently the second year medical student at the University of Vermont School of Medicine. Welcome, Raja. Most, if not all, of the Indian parents sitting here today came to the U.S. because of one main goal, to give their family the best opportunities and lifestyle they never had while growing up in India. When our parents came to the U.S., they came with that one notion. Some may not have had any predisposed idea or thought that when they would raise their children, that they would have to deal with issues such as staying up late at night, talking on the phone with the opposite sex, going to dances, dating a non-Indian, and for that matter, also an Indian. In other words, just having a lot more freedom. It is not only our Indian culture that has had to deal with these problems, but every other foreigner which has come to the U.S. to start a new life and family. Each child here is brought up in a different environment. In other words, the people whom he or she associates with, the culture they are instilled around, and of course, the religious background which they believe in. Indian children growing up in the American society encounter a tremendous amount of peer pressure, and because of this, the children may try to be people who they really are not. 
Because of these differences in environment and peer pressure, and the fact that each individual is their own individual, each child is shaped very differently, and thus his or her, her decisions and opinions in life may be different as well. At the time you we were growing up in India, ancient Indian ideals were based on a very patriarchal society, where the women did what they were told, men dictated the role in the household, and the whole society in general was just absolutely different than what we have grown up in here. Only until recently has India been evolving to more Western culture, where more freedom is given to women and children. Because of us, as first generation children, being brought up in a setting where we've had the influence of both our Indian culture as well as the American culture, you have to realize that your children may identify themselves better with someone of a different race, more religion, or culture, or even socioeconomic status. Many parents believe this is wrong, and the worst thing you can do as a parent is disown or threaten your child for their decision. You as parents will always be your children's parents, but your role in parenting may be till 18, or 21, or 26, all depending on the very fine line of age and maturity of your child. After that, your child, because of the advice you have given him or her throughout the years, will hopefully make the best decision. If I haven't conveyed anything to you yet, there is one thing, though, that I would like to remain in your mind after today, and that is the following. I do not want to preach or lecture on what the right choice is in choosing a marital partner, because the right choice can only be made by the children themselves. Lifelong decisions are based on what we have learned through our experiences, our culture, and what you have taught us while growing up. The best thing you can do as a parent is that you educate and raise your child with the right values and morals. And because of that, your child will hopefully make the right decisions, not only in choosing his or her marital partner, but also with future problems which will occur later in life. The main point I want to convey is the best you can do is parent to the best of your ability and hope the right ideals are instilled in your children so they as young, young adults can make the proper decisions through their life. surprised that the kinds of issues that you have heard articulated by these three young people were also in the minds of their parents when they were growing up. Ambition for themselves to achieve something, ideas and thoughts about sex, about dating, about marital partners. I'm sure none of the adults are strangers to those thoughts and those pressing feelings and passions. What you have heard from these three people may be conceptualized essentially as tension between ideals of affiliation and the ideals of achievement. The issues of autonomy and the issues of dependence. Issues of relatedness, connections and appropriateness versus issues of individuation and being an individual. I have prepared a few transferences here for you to basically share with you some overall issues in the psychological adaptation of Indians in America. The my data comes from my own self-observation, observation of friends and colleagues, as well as clinical data and some survey research that just says who I am. I'm a psychiatrist, I should have told you that. And that is perhaps why I have something special to say about these issues. You can go on to the next.
like to present to you very briefly these five issues. The patterns of immigration, issues of culture shock, various patterns of adaptation, the kind of casualties that occur in the process of adaptation, and then finally some recommendations. Next, please. I'm sure that many of you are aware of the three phases of immigration of Indians to the United States. The first one occurred at the turn of the century, the last century, and mainly was on the West Coast, especially California and, Brit and British Columbia. The middle phase is those of people who came I should say that in the 1920s, immigration laws changed and put very severe restriction of immigration of Asians to this country. So by and large, between the 20s and the 40s, there was a very small trickle of immigration from India to the United States. In the 40s and 50s, you had mainly students coming to the United States who came to learn and by and large stayed to earn. And then there is a third phase, a later phase of immigration, which is after the change in the laws in the late 60s, and families began to immigrate to the United States. Next, please. With the late phase of Indian immigration, of course, grew India towns, Indian temples, Indian bazaars, Indian shops, Indian foods, so on and so forth. The culture shock is the phenomenon that immigrants experience and the degree of shock is related to the distance between the host culture and the guest culture. Greater the difference, the greater, greater is the cultural disorientation and resulting in the phenomenon called culture shock. Language, customs, manners and cultural expectations prove to be important issues in these differences. And as I said at the very beginning, the major cultural difference is between the patterns of affiliation which dominate the Indian culture and the patterns of achievement which dominate the Western cultures. I should have also said that for the people, your parents, to have immigrated to this country itself suggests that they are deviants. They have to be different. They have had to be different from their contemporaries, their relatives, their family in the first place to have undertaken to disaffiliate themselves from their parents and to come to the United States for purposes of achievement as some of these people pointed out to you. And to the extent that they were prepared for this venture, their culture shock was mitigated. What results is a kind of a disorientation, almost like an acute brain syndrome, full of regrets, disbelief, nostalgia, and an ever-present wish to return back to India. Many have contemplated and yours truly being one of them who actually returned to India but didn't stay there long enough. But finally through that trajectory of adaptation some form of resolution occurs in the initial process. Go on to the next one please. These are the various patterns of adaptation. I call over identification that phenomenon in which the immigrant thinks that everything in the new country is absolutely great and everything in the old country is bad. The roads are bad, there is too much dust and too much noise, people are dirty, sanitation is very poor, food is adulterated, education is no good and on and on and in this country we have so much opportunity, there is freedom. One can move around, one can speak one's mind, one can smoke in 
front of your teacher and so on and so forth. The second is the opposite pattern. I call it a pattern of hyper-identification in which everything in the old country is absolutely wonderful and everything in the new country is problematic. There, is, there are too many drugs here, there is violence, there is exposure to sexual stimuli in this country. Children grow up too fast, they really don't have opportunity to mature, whereas in the old country we have family ties, we have sense of belonging, friendships last a lifetime, and so on and so forth. In all of this, there is always a kind of an inside-outside split, which is all not, not necessarily unique to Indians, but you, Indians make an art of it. Even in their daily lives, they speak about being like a lotus in the middle of dirt, and mud and mire, to be untouched by all that dirt, is to remain in the water and still be untouched by it. A Gujarati proverb actually says it very well, uh, roughly translated, it means that elephants have two sets of teeth, one to chew with and the other to show off with. And this is the kind of inside-outside split that Indians get pretty good at maintaining and often therefore the problem of living in two cultures persists. Not only is the inside remain quite soft and Indian, but the home, there is a special emphasis on Indianness, whereas for the same child when they go out, there is an emphasis on achievement. Baseball, basketball, football, little league, piano lessons, dancing lessons, ballet lessons, uh, doing everything that you can in school, but at home, the prime value is obedience. Because it is only obedience that continues the tradition of continuity and dependence and affiliation. So this inside-outside split is something that the young people have a particular difficulty in managing. The various processes of adaptation can be described in different kinds of ways. One of the ways in which the traditional pattern of immigration in this country, especially in the early part of this century, was called assimilation, becoming similar to. That was the idea of the melting pot, in which you became homogenized and became like everybody else. And that was the process of assimilation. Now we speak about acculturation becoming used to the culture, but not necessarily becoming the same as the other culture. And the metaphor that is used for this kind of adaptation is called the American mosaic. Each tile, tessera, remaining its unique, retaining its unique characteristic, but also blending into the larger picture and enhancing the whole. Next please. I'm going to go through this very fast. These are the various problems that arise in the process of adaptation, all kind of maladaptations result. It is distrust and alienation from the majority community, stress disorders develop, substance abuse becomes a problem for people who become maladapted. Also marital conflicts between two partners when they are moving at a different speed of acculturation occurs. And often the kind of problem that occurs is the independent development of women. And when they flower and they find their own place in society and when they go out making it on their own, that may bring about an imbalance in the marital relationship. The same kind of problems may occur in between two generations, especially on the issue of obedience and affiliation. Suicides occur, depression is not uncommon, and above all, a major problem of stigma about psychiatric problems and consulting psychiatrists still persists, even amongst physicians of Indian origin in this country. Lastly, I have some recommendations. 
which have to do with the primary values that I have learned that help, that help people in making a better adaptation, gaining their full worth, and flowering all their potentiality have to do with being able to introspect. And therefore, through that introspection, have a respect for one's past, as well as integrating and having respect for one's present goes a long way in developing empathy for people who may have difficulty in adaptation. The kind of thing that this association provides, kind of voluntary organization, which is very much apropos and appropriate to the American culture, unlike the Indian social groups, which provide social support and go a long way in bringing about a better adaptation. The kind of social services that are needed for the Indian community, not only in providing services back home to our medical colleges or our alma maters, but also a variety of social services enhance the adaptation of immigrants to this culture. And in that process, as you have heard from this three young people, a new identity emerges. Thank you very much. I will first give Amal, Madhu, and Rajan an opportunity to respond to each other or something that occurred to them after listening to each other, and this may be the time to do that. Amal, anything? Could we have the lights turned on a little more? I'm sorry? Could we have the lights turned on a little more? Yes, please. Yeah, well, I mean, if, uh, can everyone hear me, first of all? Oh, yes. Yeah? Okay. Do you use the microphone? For recording, I want to. Oh, we can just hold it. We can hold it. We can hold it. Okay. Why don't we pass the mic around? Yeah, I just like to. Uh, expand on a couple of the points that you that you brought up in your in your talk, and I think that it is true that there is uh, really a fundamental tension between um, how uh, kids interact in the home and how they interact when they go out to school and they play with their or they interact with their peers. And uh, a lot of times, how that tension gets resolved is is a little unhealthy. Just looking in, in terms of um, some of my friends, and that a lot of uh, Indian kids sometimes lead um, schizophrenic lives, and I don't mean that in the, in the psychological sense, but in the sense that they interact in a completely different way when they get home, um, as opposed to how they interact with people when they're outside. And uh, how exactly that gets resolved um, can be a little bit unsettling, I guess. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to expand on that. Actually, I was going to make a very similar point to Amol. Um, I don't know. Um, there's one thing that I've very seen, very clearly seen, is that from the time, I think all of us, us three at least, I think we're all around the similar age, around 23, 24. And I remember from the time when we were kids, around 10, 11 years old, to when I look at kids now who are currently 10, 11 years now, there's so much difference how we grew up, at least in my opinion, than the kids who are currently 10 or 11 years, 14 year olds now. I can't believe when I look at these kids nowadays, how much they know, how much they know just about everything in general, just everything in general. I remember my, for myself, I was a very naive child and, and I look at other any kids who were at the time I were growing up, and I remember it was pretty much the same thing as well. And I've seen that the kids who are growing up now, I think it seems to be much harder on the Indian family right now because the gap between how they're being how they're being raised right now in this American society, Indo-American society, is much different than we were growing up, and it seems to be causing a lot more clash within the family. 
Um, No, I don't think the parents have changed. I just think, um, I'm just saying children in general, it seems to be much more, uh, the kids seem to be much more, have much more freedom growing up now. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like when I look at these kids growing up in high school right now, and the problems that are going on in high school, and the, and the knowledge and just, a lot of things they just do in school. For example, the, the drugs problem, the alcohol problem, all those things when we were growing up, 12, 13, 14 year old did not exist then. I mean, I mean, it did exist, but to a much, much, much lesser degree than the kids now who are growing up at 12, 13, 14 years old. And I don't think it has to do with the parents. I think it has to do with just the society here just progressing a lot much rapidly than, I mean, than you expect. You're talking about the negative aspects. Excuse me, sir. Do you mind coming over here and uh, let's give Madhu a chance to finish her comments and then uh, if you'd all please use the floor mic. Uh, people who are hearing impaired like me would benefit from that. Um, all I really have to say is that if you listen to the, uh, what all three of us have said, it basically all boils down to communication. And you can, I, I think, if you, if your parents are available to be and, and want to be open-minded, or at least you really need to listen to your children and understand what they're going through. Um, it is different. It's different than the way you were raised. It, it's different than, and our children will be different than the way we were raised. But basically, um, just try to be open-minded. I think communication is key, and and try not to, you know, be too not open-minded. <laughs> yes, sir. Young people, old people, old, huh? We didn't bring old people here. Yes. Come on down, ask me some questions. <laughs> I'm happy to see so many children here. They are not children, more teenagers uh, who came to this uh, symposium. When we did the first time in Daytona, we did not have this much crowd. And I want to congratulate the California Convention Committee who has made a great effort to have so many people come here and everybody is interested. Uh, we have been thinking and uh, we would like the children and the spouses of the members of BMCC, BMCA more Ill involved in these different types of projects, especially the youth forum and different projects. And we need their talents, especially in different subjects like art, public relations and other things. And we need to entertain some suggestions and also thoughts for the future. They can give me in writing or they can contact me or if they want to discuss during this forum, it's open. I want everybody to participate. Why children are not asking questions? They don't have to ask questions, they can say. They can say, they can make comments. Come on, get on the ball, the mic is yours. This is the whole thing is for yours. We need to learn from you. Hi, Mom. Hi there, how are you? Now you're in trouble. <laughs> Already. Okay, uh, I just want to stress Madhu's point, communication. It's very, very important for all of us parents. I'm a parent and I know. Many times we get set in our own thinking that there is only one way, right way is our right way. So I think we need to learn to listen also. I mean, we listen to our patients and make the diagnosis. Why can't we listen to our children and listen carefully what they have to say? Because that's where the major impact is. About the dating and all that, I think I do agree with children, all young adults that I think it is their right to decide. We have raised our children with a good culture, good sound knowledge, and they have learned, make, uh, learned to make right decisions. Of course, they're gonna make mistakes and all that, but that's what we are here for as parents, to guide them during this process of growing. But I think the ultimate end should be their decision. 
And once we learn those two tricks, communication and listening to children with respect, I think we have won the medal more than 60%. So that's my comment. Uh, you have a daughter? It doesn't matter. I want a daughter twice. All right? I had two boys and I'm proud of my children. Even if I had a daughter, my thinking and what I spoke is not going to change a single bit. Because we have not treated our children differently. We are sending the, our children, boys and girls, to the same school, give them the same education, develop them in a different hobbies and all that. So why do we suddenly change our standards that, okay, you are a girl, so Sunita cannot do anything, and here, Mahesh can do whatever they want. He can't have that. And once we, husbands and wives, whatever, in the bedroom, we decide that, okay, this is how we're going to raise our children and work as a common force. I think it's going to work well. I think, uh, let me just uh, make a comment on uh, Surya Khan Patel, coming from Maryland. Uh, I have to, you know, listening to uh, speakers, uh, that uh, there, is a, there is a gender gap when, when, you, when the parents treat their children, even though, uh, you know, this previous... Uh, Sulu. Sulu, okay. Uh, she did not say that, well, I would have not treated differently, but it's very hard unless, you know, you have both uh, daughters and girls. And, and there is, you know, there is a difference and there is going to be different. Uh, that was my comment. I have a question to the, any panelist that can answer that uh, you touched a very sensitive issue and there is a difference uh, between the uh, immigrants and the first generation and there will be difference between the new generation that also was um, mentioned that 10 years ago was a different thing and now it's different and probably 10 years ago, I mean 10 years from now will be different. Uh, can anybody can comment on uh, about religion uh, that uh, are these young members uh, compared to the immigrants more religious? Do they have religious values? Do they, are they believe in any religion? Do they believe in God? Do they don't or they don't believe? I'd like to have, you know, have some comments from the panelists. Um, I think it totally depends on how your family um, raised you to be. Um, my mom's got us going to temple all summer every Sunday, and it's great. I love it. Um, it's, it's wonderful. But, I mean, everybody's different. And I think most, I don't think Indian kids are as religious as their parents are. But, I mean, that's just from what I've seen, but I think um, I think everyone basically believes in, or most people are, are, are religious, they do believe in God in that sense. I mean, they may not go to temple every day or, or you know, you know, do the whole deal, but I think they basically, basically are. Yeah, I've uh, followed in my uh, father's footsteps, I guess. He was uh, uh, a radical humanist, uh, an unadulterated atheist, and uh, uh, I think uh, I've kind of uh, followed in, in that uh, vein as well. But I mean, I certainly, um, I went to Catholic school actually for, for high school. And uh, uh, I think trying to get through, to know different religions and the, and the way that uh, religion can act is a, is a real powerful influence, positive impact in people's lives. And I think I definitely appreciate that, that uh, as far as my personal views on religion, I, you know, I don't. I'm not religious, but uh, what other people want to share? Okay. Uh, about the religion, I think... Uh, say who you are, please. Anand Lapsiola, from California. Um, I think as for religion, the first generation, especially people who are, you know, uh, first generation, even upcoming second generations, for religion, it's more of an active process for us. Um, the first, the people who immigrated from India, they were exposed to that religion uh, through school, 
for their parents. Uh, they had, you know, just a society that was built up around the religion. And here, to become religious or to even get exposed to religion to learn about, you know, the Mahabharata, Ramayana, you would have to actively go out and seek that or your, your family would have to be religious. So, you know, in some cases here, if your family is not religious, that almost sets up for the kids not being that religious. And um, that's maybe one thing that we have to work on to see, you know, to, to improve that. I'm Manoj uh, from South Carolina. I'm an anesthesiologist by trade, so I give epidurals to women who are in labor. So uh, there's a lot of things going on when we come in, and usually there's a lot of screaming and cussing going on. I have a running joke with the fathers, and I say, you know, I've had two kids and that didn't hurt a bit, so I don't know what you're complaining about. So, um, <laughs> So my question is to the young people today, uh, you're telling us how to be good parents. That's very good, but you've not had any kids. Uh, and, and just like I said, I had two kids and it didn't hurt a bit. And I can't understand why the patient is so impatient for her epidural to be given right away. Just like that, you know, it's very easy to tell people how to be parents you if you've never been a parent. So my question to the young people today is, are you going to let your kids do everything that you feel that your parents should let you do? <laughs> yes. Parents on, on how to do better parenting. It's also easy to say, yeah, when well, I'm a parent, I'm going to hit, I'm going to be as liberal as, as uh, I advocate now. And I, I don't think that you can really fully understand the, the magnitude or uh, responsibilities of being a parent until you've actually had kids. Uh, but again, these are just some general guidelines that I think that are good to follow, but uh, would have to get hashed out as, you know after you actually have the experience of having kids. No, <laughs> I wouldn't. I, I'm. I think Indian parents and uh, parents in general, if you, unless you totally or unless you make a, a make an active process to not be like your parents, you just end up exactly like them. And I think my parents are, are really conservative, and I'm very conservative too. And I'm sure I won't let them do anything, <laughs> or at least think about it a lot more. If I may add my two cents. To that equation, I would say that it is important for parents to be custodians of tradition and for the young people to be initiators of change. And only then will the whole process of growth and development will continue to occur. Yes, sir. To youth forum before, and most of the time I noticed that youth were winning and get what they wanted. <laughs> uh, you have a boy or girl, they do dating. They bring his or her friend at home and as a parent you know his or her friend. The next thing they want to experiment the sex. First I would like to ask a comment from the youth. Do you feel it is appropriate to do? And second question as a parent, you let them do with the advice of safe sex or say them no, no, it's okay. Uh, I think this whole issue stems from the very beginning of how you raise your children. Throughout their whole childhood and whatnot, I assume as a parent, you're gonna direct them in the right direction and give them proper decision-making roles. You're gonna teach them the right values and the morals. And whether what you say, don't do it or do it, they're gonna do it anyway. You can't stop your children from what they're gonna do. On the contrary, if you make such more and more restrictions on your children, they're actually, from what I've seen, are going to do actually the opposite and do just more and more to what you don't want to do. The only thing I think that a parent can do is you direct your child in the right direction. And then from that point on, they're going to have to make the right decision. Whether it's wrong or right, 
hopefully they'll be right. And if it's wrong, they'll learn from their mistakes. But um, no, I don't think when I'm a parent that I'm not, I, just from growing up, I don't think, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell them what my opinions are and through the course of their growing up. And when I feel that they uh, are, I think of the right age to make their decisions, you're gonna have to make the left, you're gonna have to let them make the right decision on their own. And, uh, I agree with Raj, and uh, I think that it's, uh, it's ultimately a decision that's going to be made by the kid, and it can either be made in a healthy environment or in an unhealthy environment. And I think that uh, as a parent, if you, um, if you give them a sense of the enormity of what that decision means, uh, and if you give them a sense of, of what the repercussions are, that they will internalize that, um, as I know I have. So uh, anytime there are rigid rules put down as to what people can and cannot do, there's always an impetus to rebel. And if it's done in a healthy environment, if there's one that's, there's some legitimate communication, uh, that the right decision will be made. I'm Panna Barai. I'm from Munster, Indiana. From the panelists, as well as from any youth in the audience, I think we as parents want to know what is the real, not biased, definition of dating. In our mind, it is very simple definition, but as we talk to our children, it seems like a definition is altered to any extent that individual wants. And I think that's where the difference, arguments, clashes, everything comes. All children at a proper age, now that's very important, should date. It's important to date, but I think the meaning is not understood in a right way. So I would like to learn from all of you. Let's hear. I will tell you what is my understanding. Sir, moderator, could we ask the children from the audience to respond also? Right, that's yeah, right. Because I would what like a wonderful to... suggestion. I ask all the young people to respond. Okay, that was my mom. Um, <laughs> about dating, I. I know maybe in India when you were growing up there might have been a simple definition, but here I don't think you can really have that because the way society is changing and the way that every individual has their differences, especially with us first generation kids because we have you know, influ influences from both societies and you know, both upbringings. I don't think there is a simple definition. I really think you need maybe to talk it out with your child, but you have to trust their decision to end because there isn't going to be a simple definition. And there shouldn't be because I, I don't know, you know, each person is different and there really should be an individual definition for each person. Maybe that's according to each family. I'd also like to comment, um, I'm not sure, I think it was you, about uh, being easy to lecture parents. I understand where you're coming from, yeah, we, yes, we haven't been parents, but you also haven't grown up in the society which we're growing up in, so I know it's also easy to tell us how to be good kids in the society. But again, you haven't done that, and that's why I think it was important. I think you said about communication, where you really need to talk it out. Neither one of us have been in each other's sh shoes, and I think that's why communication is really important. So. conservative or a lot of Indian parents think that um, dating is just sex and, and I don't, I mean, it, that's not really the case. Um, if you want to define dating, I would say a close friendship with the potential of being something r romantic or long term. But it's not, you know. Now, let, let's hear the boys. What are your views? You know? <laughs> 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 when, when a girl says no, is it no for, no for you? What do you mean, no for you, meaning? <laughs> what, what do you, you know, I mean, the, you go out on a date, and a lady draws a line, says no. Is it no for you? No. How do you? Well, that's because good. ultimately, our daughters, you yeah, know, that we worry about. As a parent, parents are more worried about daughters. Because the boys are given that freedom. Yeah, and 
in spite of what she says, uh, in every household there is a dual kind of, uh, you know, leaning towards uh, what a boy does, what a girl does. And that comes from our generations of thinking. And in the process, the boys also start thinking that they can go out and do whatever they want and it will be all right, where else the girls can't do it. Now these boys may be dating the girls, those are our daughters. So we want to hear from you guys uh, what your values are, when, what they say. When they say no, does it mean no for you or you still be persistent about it? <laughs> How do, you, how do you expect us to answer that question? No, it's, 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 I mean, uh, another way to phrase it would be, are you a villain or are you not? Um, no, I, you know, I just, uh, obviously, I mean, if there, if there are lines, you know, they will not be crossed. I mean, that's just, that's how I feel. I mean, I think most of my friends feel that way. One other way to answer that question would be to say that in India, the great country, the great culture, sex has never occurred outside of marriage. Isn't that, all, isn't that true? Absolutely true? And I would like the parents to, I'm not saying I'm preaching something, but I would like parents to seriously consider that if your daughters know where to put their foot down, and if their relationship with their opposite sex male is pretty secure, when they say no, there is a respect in the relationship, and that line will never be crossed. Any other, any other um, hello, my name is Kosha Bakshi, and I'm from Chicago. I'm the daughter of Dr. Bakshi, um, obviously. Um, I don't know if I'm a little off topic or off subject here, but I think it needs to be discussed. Um, we've been talking about communication a lot, and I also think we need to discuss the topic of trust. Um, trust is a very, very important thing here because if I, I feel if my parents trust me, I am more apt to do what they think you know I'm doing. I mean, if I, I tell my parents this is where I'm going to be, if they trust, that's where I'm going to be. That's where I'm going to be. You know, that's who I'm going to be with. And, I mean, they also, parents need to trust the children's judgment. If we're grown up with the type of morals and values, they, if they trust us, we're more apt to do so. Um, a lot, I, I know my mom has said this before when I talk about something like this. She'll say, it's not that we don't trust you, it's we don't trust everyone else. But, and while that is true, that is very true, it's, you also have to trust us not to put ourselves in that kind of situation. We, if you trust us, our judgment, we won't put ourselves in the kind of situation where something bad from outside will happen. So not only is communication key, I think trust is key from parent to child and child to parent. I think, Kosha, I agree with you about the trust. Only the question comes here is the probably parents have passed many more years in growing up. Maybe they have a little bit more uh, depth to the subject. Maybe they have a little bit more understanding of the, what is going on in perspective. And that's why, as a parents, I'm talking about all, not just me or uh, could be or anybody, but that we might be telling you something more re very repeatedly just to make sure that it goes in your mind in the right way that it should be. Now going back in the, with the dating definition, if anybody else wants to respond. Why don't you go ahead and say what right. I have to say I, I, think, people. I think one thing that dating is good as long as it's healthy. It is important, it is necessary at the right age, but at the same time, from whatever I know, or from whatever I have done, a little bit of research in understanding what the dating should be for a long time, and I feel that it should not go to the extent of sex. To know a person, to talk in terms that you could be partners, marriage partners, all those things are important and that does mean dating. 
but when it goes to the sacks, I don't think there could be any trials like that. So that's the only thing I feel that children should really understand it. Thank you. My name is Sheila Mehta, I'm from California. I'm going to go a little further and explore the views or present an issue that we all think about but never talk about. And dating the same sex and age are the two issues that I'm concerned about the young people to be aware of and I just want some views and opinions. You know, we are talking about the only opposite sex and heterosexual relationship. Up in California, in New York, and some of the states, we also face the issue of gay and lesbians and I really want young people to be aware of or present their views in that area. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you bring that up uh, because uh, throughout the 15 minute discussion that we've had so far, all dating issues have been related to, to men and women. And, um, you know, I think that it's uh, definitely something that should be discussed, and I, I just like I think sex is a is a topic that's very taboo. Um, so is homosexuality uh, to a certain extent. And I think communication cuts across should cross, cut across every single um, area, and that includes uh, orientation, includes uh, whether or not to have sex. So I think it's an interesting point. Um, go ahead. Either one of you want to add something? Um, on the issue of homosexuality and AIDS, there is a lot of already physiological, biological basis on homosexuality and what, how your child develops may already be predisposed. So the only thing you can do as a parent is, is you guide them and, and communicate with them and you just hope for the best. My name is uh, Nishandu Bakshi. Uh, my daughter just came and uh, mentioned something about trust, which I think was very apropos. Uh, just a few comments, if you will. Uh, I look at it myself uh, for, from my perspective, and I think that this is true for many of the parents. Uh, we are a whole lot more liberal than our parents were. Uh, believe me, uh, my communication with my children is much, 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 much more than my father ever talked to me. For, for me, my father's, you know, word was the final word. This is it, you do it or else. Uh, I have four children, ranging from 20 to 9, so I'm going through the uh, adult down to a pre-teenager to a not so young child of nine. Uh, boys, girls, both combined, so although my son is the youngest one, so I have not gone through the stages of a son going through that. Uh, we, at least my wife and I, feel that we try to maintain communication with the children as much as we possibly can. And uh, from the children's perspective, uh, you know, they think that one child is being treated better or different than the other, and that's because each child has to be treated differently. Their tendencies are a little different. We try to give the children guidance in what they do in their life. My oldest daughter went through a situation just very recently where when she was going through that, when we tried to tell her, she would not, uh, she had a sort of a rebellious nature which says, no dad, you don't understand. When the whole situation was over, she came back and she said, dad, you were right in what you were saying. So. Believe me, we, we have seen a whole lot more of the situation than what you feel. Of course, we have to let you do what you want to do, given a certain leeway in understanding. Um, and that's, that's my basic comment as far as that is concerned. One more comment about religion, and this is my personal feeling. Please don't mis uh, misinterpret religion as mythological stories. Please don't misinterpret religions as rituals. Religion is a way of life. Religion is a way of life. Uh, is here. So after uh, Pratip, you can make your comments. I'm going to ask you to hold your question from the floor and invite Shetan up here. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Pratip Mehta from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, 
I think all this hang up about sex is probably parents and not the kids. <laughs> I also think it's no longer a question of sex, it's a question of safe sex. My comment is about uh, what I heard the other day from a patient. He was a journalist uh, from Texas in the uh, mid-50s. And I remember reading that report in an Indian newspaper uh, about 40 years ago. The India's ambassador G.R. Mehta was visiting uh, Houston and he was denied service because of the color of his skin. Similarly, if you remember Nehru's sister, Krishna Hathi Singh, she was married to Raja Hathi Singh, who unfortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but who happened to be dark skin, unlike Krishna. Krishna. The Raja Hathi Singh himself also was denied service in a restaurant in New York not long ago. So this is the problem that I want to draw attention that you, some of us who have been here long enough, sometimes we face criticism or some reference to our color and that uh, young people at your age, you are idealistic as we all were, but as you grow older and face true life in this country, prepare yourself that you may face some ugly people who might just where he suddenly remind you of a very unpleasant subject which we don't like to talk about. Now I fall on the University of Michigan with a major in music education and her future goal is to become a professional artist. At this time she does some acting and modeling as well. Please come and join us here. Thank you. I apologize for being late. I've chosen um, an awkward career where auditions come up uh, spur of the moment. So, um, let me give you a little background. I'm 24, um, here in LA, moved from Detroit about a year ago. Uh, I'm a singer. I did graduate from U of M with a music degree, uh, music education. And um, I am singing in a band right now and I do a little acting and modeling to support. And I was teaching as well to support myself, but my parents are primarily supporting me right now. So um, I don't want to change the subject from the issues that were on the floor to um, career again, but what I can do is I'll just sit down and if anyone has any questions specifically towards me or my career or any um, issues about how my parents have supported me and why everything worked out for me and my family, you can ask me directly. Well, why don't you do that? Oh. Take a few minutes and do um, that. Okay. Um, Let's see, when I was in high school, in senior high school, I decided I wanted to major in music. And for my parents, it was never a question like, no, you can't do it, or no, we don't think you should. They supported me. And I think the reason why was because I uh, come, first of all, I come from a very musical family. But also, um, right from the start, about junior high, puberty time, uh, when you know, you're very concerned with going out with your friends, and um, having more freedom from your family. I, I remember spending many hours arguing with my mom about why I can't go to a movie with a girlfriend or why I can't go to a party with some friends. And um, I wouldn't always get my way, but I, ne I never backed down from an argument or a discussion, I should say. And basically what I'm saying is I really stood up for what I, what I wanted. And I think um, that pattern established early enough in my relationship with my parents um, continued to develop throughout high school and throughout college. So when I said I wanted to do something a little bit different, um, they were more supportive simply because I was always honest and, not always honest, but most of the time as honest as I could be <laughs> with my parents. Um, even though that meant in college 
you know, telling my parents who I was dating, never, never dated an Indian. Um, it was difficult for my mom, it was difficult for my, my dad, but um, I didn't want to shelter them from that because that would just hurt me, I think, would have just hurt me. So I did that, you know, in college I would tell them everything that was going on with me so that we could have an open uh, relationship and that's basically how I got them to support me. And also it was never, um, as far as moving to LA, I mean that, I think if you're going to do something a little different career-wise rather than just medical school or, or law school or whatever, you have to be serious. I, mean, I, think, I think so many kids say, I want to be a rock star or I want to you know, be an actress, but I was very, very serious about it. I spent you know, weekend after weekend gigging and uh, rehearsing five nights a week during the, out of the seven, rehearsing. So those little things showed my parents that I was, in fact, very serious about pursuing a career in music. And it wasn't just, oh, I just want to be a rock star, you know. So those little things I think kids can do uh, to show their parents and the parents can, t you know, take notice as, as far as what their kids are doing in college and where their interests lie. Um, instead of just saying, you know, go to med school, go to med school. You have to pay attention to what your kids really want to do. And I know that I'm very happy because there's nothing else that I think I'm as good at or have as much passion for. And um, I can't imagine going through life, waking up every morning, saying, oh man, I gotta go to class, I gotta go to med school, I gotta go see patients, you know, if that's not what I wanted to do. I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, so you do what you want to do and hopefully your parents will support you, they're minded, I'm very fortunate. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. There's a young person who has a special question. Yeah, you know, you know sure. could, could her parents, could we acknowledge them? Oh, could we acknowledge their, her parents? Are they here? Would you please rise? I think that is a big hand. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why don't you come up here and do this? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm Nika Johnny and I'm from England. Um, you talk about religion in school and you're taught Christianity. Then you go home and then you're taught Hindu religion. It's really confusing in what to believe in. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's true. It, it is very confusing. And uh, uh, I think uh, for somebody who's living in India, uh, and if your family is Hindu, uh, I think it's pretty much taken for granted that, that uh, you were going to be raised Hindu as well. And I think uh, in a society such as this, there are so many different religions that I don't know who it was that made the point um, earlier, but there, there's more of an active process that goes on here about where you conscientiously choose exactly what religion you're going to follow and, and what sorts of rules you, and uh, philosophy you're going to entertain about how you're going to live your life. And yes, it is confusing, but uh, I think that uh, we've been given free choice and that can be a, a very liberating process, and I think you can learn a lot about yourself in making that choice. Okay. Well, I think I was going to get up and ask the, not ask the question, the comment, or the religion. And I, I'm glad this came again. I am a strongly believer in Hindu, I think God, there are many definitions of God, innumerous definitions, and therefore there are innumerous religions. My son, I don't know what he believes in, but he might be believing in Hindu. On the other side, my daughter is completely Christian. When we have a prayer, which we do Hindu prayer at home, she may not participate. But we came to understand that we have to recognize and respect what the children want to follow the religion. 
So that to follow religion is an independent decision of the children. Help them, guide them, but let them decide. May I make a brief comment uh, in response to what uh, the gentleman up here said and what uh, Dr. Dilipbert said? I think uh, choice is a very important thing and um, uh, it should be done by everybody. That's uh, why a human being is here on this earth, uh, for freedom and choice. Uh, the one thing about uh, religion is uh, uh, that uh, if you're going to make a choice, first of all, I think you should have the knowledge about religions. If you're going to make a choice about religions, then you should know what Hinduism first or whatever your religion your parents gave you first of all to start with. And jumping to something which uh, uh, you may uh, necessarily not know about is an important factor. And if it is a conscious choice where you have studied deeply what first of all what your own religion has been and is, and then acquiring or adopting something else is a different matter than acquiring something because the majority around you may be doing it or because of uh, other pressures which may have nothing to do with uh, really uh, choice in its true sense and uh, knowledge. So I think knowledge is very important there. Thank you. Just to go along with that, I think that uh, you know, religion has the capability of being a very uh, divisive force. Uh, I don't think, I mean, if anybody's looked at the situation in Northern Ireland or in uh, in Kashmir, and I don't think you can really disagree with that. Um, but I think it's the point made by uh, Dr. Budd is a good one: is that should someone decide to choose a certain religion, uh, it's a choice that affects them and, and should be handled with understanding. Because again, the tension, the capacity to divide, um, is great. Please. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Apsala Desai. My father is Kamlesh Desai. My mother is Marjorie. You know, and I wanted to address specifically the young girl from England's her question um, because uh, I mean we we I've heard a lot of mention about division because of the two disparate religions and about choices, but um, I mean. Yes, of course, the choices are going to be difficult as you go along and as you learn more about the different religions, but what I think I've benefited from the most is that is the, the common bonds between the two. I think the best things about each religion, um, the, the best precepts and tenets of each religion are things that you can have enough, in, they have enough in common with each other, there's enough harmony between them that, that you can find, you can, whatever choice you end up making later on, if it becomes important to you to make, um, what, it, what am I to, to make division between the two? Uh, I'm not, that's not what I mean to say. But there's there's enough to find in common between the two that you can you can derive the best parts of each and make it your own. This is <laughs> make your make your you can you can make whatever it is for yourself. It's unique, but there the best to be gained from each religion. There, it's not going to, there's not going to be conflict in the end between the two. Strength and devotion, strength in, in faith, devotion to faith, duty, um, generosity, humility, attention, kindness towards others. Those things are common to all the religions that, you know, that you'll be exposed to. Anyway. mother. <laughs> And I just had to stand because uh, our family is a prime example of religion being a uh, major subject. Kamlesh comes to church with us, or used to, uh, before work took over, including the MC work. <laughs> uh, and I have read as much as I could about Hinduism. And I can tell you that uh, when the kids were little, we prayed, uh, we gave grace before dinner. They had to be kept from confusion, so we kept one simple thank you for, for the food we eat. But now we pray uh, a Hindu prayer, because they're older enough now uh, not to be confused. They know the difference. And I know in myself, and I, I'm sure about 
him too how he thinks. The major uh, factor that keeps us together is respect for each other's spirituality. It doesn't matter what you believe, I respect you for what you believe and I'll try to learn as much from you. Hinduism is the model of tolerance. I would be ashamed if um, I didn't learn from that. It would be a shame if I didn't learn from that. When uh, his parents came to visit us for the first time in Binghamton, New York, one Sunday morning, uh, we lingered in bed. This was uh, church time. And I said to him, let's skip church today for Papa and Mommy's sake. So we agreed, and we went to the dining room and found them dressed, fully dressed. And there they were, and they said, we're ready to go to church with you. What can be so bad about that? I'm very glad for those comments, because it just occurred to me that the way medical college uh, that where I studied, among my classmates were Muslims and Christians and Parsis and Jains, Sikhs. Please go ahead. I'm Patel from New York, and I'm going to go back to the interesting subject of dating. I think I heard a lot of questions about dating. What does it mean? <laughs> Do we allow that? Is it Hinduism that allows dating? I don't think we really ask the questions we want to discuss here. I think everybody within our hearts have a fear. What does it mean? What extent is children going to take this to? I think the real question we are dodging is, <clears throat> do we have one standard for male boys and another standard for girls? My provocative, uh, <coughs> provocative, uh, provocative question is, how long are we going to allow these double standards? That's the real issue here. I think we should discuss that. My name is Neelam Patel, and I'm daughter of Kanu and Usha Patel. And um, now that we're on the subject of religion and dating, we had a major issue at our house for the last two or three years. I was dating a Muslim guy, and my parents didn't approve of it. And it hurt me a lot because I, I tried to make them understand that it wasn't the, I wasn't dating him because he was Muslim and I was Hindu. I was dating, dating him because I loved him and I wanted to date him. And it was a major problem in our house and they wouldn't accept him. And um, my sister was dating a Gujarati Hindu. And I don't want to embarrass my mom or my parents, but it was very hard for me and I would like to tell the other parents that just because one daughter or son is doing something that you don't approve of and the other one is, it's your responsibility to be supportive both ways. You shouldn't just deny the other daughter of the same attention that you, you shouldn't deny her of anything because just because she's doing something that you don't approve of, you should try to understand that she knows what she's doing, she's doing things from her heart, she knows what she's doing. And just because one is doing something that, you know, Gujaratis want them to do, you know, Hindu, Gujarati, Gujarati, pre-med, whatever, it's, you know, it's, it's not fair. And I would like to tell the other parents that you should really be supportive no matter what your kids do, regardless of religion, dating, career, whatever. That's Right. Yes. Yes. My name is Jyothi Bhatt and I'm from Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I, I appreciate um, what the young lady just said now about um, her dating a Muslim boy because I believe that we all have to get along in this world and no matter what you believe in, we should all learn to get along and learn about each other because that's the most important thing. And um, let me just put my little two cents in about dating. I believe that um, America is the land of the free, and 
everyone deserves the right of pursuit of happiness and life and liberty. And um, I believe that nowadays the second generation Indian kids, if they're going to be able to choose their own spouses in the future, they should learn about all types of people. And that's why I think dating is an important issue in these days. And we should pay more attention to it. Thank you. I'm Kirit Shah from Alabama. I was born and raised Hindu. But I'm very broad-minded. Uh, I go to temples for prayer, and I go to church for prayer. My son is Hindu. My daughter is Christian. She's dating a Christian boy, very nice, fine boy. And I encourage and support both of them. I don't know what religion my other daughter would adopt. She goes to temple. She also goes to church. I do want to give one comment or advice to all the youngsters. Whatever your religion, whatever your parents' religion, look up to God as the source of inner strength and inspiration. If you derive inspiration and inner strength from whatever the God or whatever the religion, believe in that and do what you believe is the right thing. Once again, I'd like to make a brief comment. I just could not hold, but uh, responding to the young lady over here. I know she's in a very difficult situation. I don't know what the current status is. And I think uh, many of the parents may in future go through that when you are, um, and I'm talking about religion and values over here once again. I think uh, even uh, Mahatma Gandhi went through this uh, a long time ago when he uh, studied all the religions and he studied them in great detail, uh, friends. And then finally, he came back to whatever religion he was because he says that he said that basically all religions, as many of you have stated earlier, say the same thing. And that if you find what is in yours, uh, God is one, and uh, then you stick to it. If you find uh, that, uh, and if you build um, uh, local, uh, uh, on a more uh, different level, uh, the problem comes in on a practical level when uh, religions are mixed uh, sometimes, and I think the young people have to realize that, uh, that's what I mean when I say knowledge, is that uh, uh, as long as there is respect, as someone said earlier, uh, for, uh, uh, for the person with the other religion, to respect your religion and let you follow your religion, there are some religions are, which are more, unfortunately or fortunately, they are misinterpreted and they are more inflexible in their attitudes. And, um, I think one question I would put to uh, an individual if at that point, uh, if you're faced with the situation is whether he or she is ready to accept your religion or whether he or she wants you to convert or something else like that. I think that becomes an important point on a practical level. The other thing you have to remember is what are you going to give to your children and your next generation when you think about all these things. I think many of the times uh, when two parents uh, of different religions the children tend to grow up irreligious or they believe in a, a certain moral philosophy without uh, some religious background. I'm not sure in my own mind whether that is necessarily going to lead to other further problems for the future generations. So I think there are some practical points which have to be addressed here and I just wanted to remind everybody of it. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, I just I want everyone to know that I have the best parents in the world. I mean, they didn't do any, that's just the way they were raised, and I don't want them to think or anybody else to think that I'm, you know, trying to say something against them. I just want to, you know, hear. We have about five more minutes now for the session. So we will start with the people who are in the line here. So please uh, make your comments, please. Uh, make it short. Uh, my name is Vipin Awasya from Charleston, West Virginia. Graduated in 1968-69 time frame. And I hear all these people who are about the same age we were in medical school. And I hate to say it this way, but right across the medical school's door, there was, a, I believe, a Kasi Vishwanath temple. And I did not see any of my seniors, same classmates or juniors, going in and out of that temple at any time. <laughs> so if you are, <laughs> to me, uh, religion is a more 
the system of values that we develop, what is right, what is wrong, how can we be useful and do right to our fellow men and women where we go to sleep, we don't have a feeling that we have done something wrong to somebody. And when you look at all religions, ultimately that is what it boils down to. The conflicts that arise when you have marriages where... The lady over here said something about this is America, and I think that is very... I, I kind of want to emphasize that, and what I have to say may be a little cliche, but it's very true. This is America, and America has often been described as the melting pot, where everyone needs to be looked at as equal. All men created equal. So, we, like, this young lady over here said something about she was dating a Muslim. We can't look at it as a Hindu dating a Muslim. We gotta look at it as a human dating a human. Two people seeing each other for the pure enjoyment of each other's company and not to rebel against their parents and seeing a Muslim, oh my God, you know? It's, it's more of, you know, we are the melting pot. We need to be all humans. We need to be all people and not separated into these categories where no one can integrate themselves with each other. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Rina, and Neelam is my sister. And um, I just wanted to say, um, in defense of both her and my parents, that I was with my sister like when she was going out with this guy who was Muslim. And at the beginning, I truly believe that my parents were wrong because they were so against her dating him because... because <laughs> I'm getting somebody. No more oh, okay, because she was Muslim and, and that I always took her side because I thought that that was really fair, unfair for them to, to put her in that kind of position. But as her relationship progressed, I saw that the problem that my parents had with him wasn't so much that he was Muslim or what he was or it was more his, the, the moral character that was evident from seeing him and, and speaking to him. It was more of a personal problem that I think they had with him. And I, I do believe that the problem started with him being Muslim, but I don't think that my parents would have been that rigid with my sister because the bottom line is at some point they were going to have to compromise. You know, if they loved my sister and they wanted to be a part of her life, they would have had to, you know, just because of his religion, they would have had to compromise too. But I think that the, the problem was deeply rooted in other issues, you know, it wasn't just religion. And I think that when people come up here and say, well, this is America, you know, and we should, we should respect everybody and we should be open with everybody, you know, I mean, that's true, but is that realistic? Like one man said earlier, you're going to, you know, there's people that are prejudiced in this world, you know? I mean, I've been in situations when I've been prejudiced against. I was born and raised in this country. Is that fair for me? No, it's not. And to turn your, to turn your, to turn, and turn away and say, yeah, we should respect everybody. Yeah, you should respect everybody, but you shouldn't forget your roots, you know? And that when your parents, you shouldn't put your parents in a position where they have to sacrifice themselves and their traditions, just like your parents shouldn't put you in that position, so that you have to sacrifice what you believe in, you know? And I mean, I think that whether you're going to go to medical school or whether you're like Sheetal and you're going to, you know, pursue your other dreams and hopes, it's important that you don't give up and that you you have like a plan for yourself and in the end that you could fight for what you want on your own without your parents because I know what I want for my future is what I want who I'm gonna marry is who I'm gonna marry and if my parents don't want me to marry that person I will be really sad but that if it's gonna come to a point where I'm gonna be like you know what I'm, I'm you know if you're not gonna support me in college you know that's if that's gonna be my decision if I do this and you're not gonna support me there that's going to be the decision. I'm not going to sacrifice what I believe in. I don't expect them to do any different. And I think that, you know, everybody needs to face reality, you know. If you're that motivated... I hate to interrupt you, but we are really not interrupting you. I just want to say, if you're that motivated, you know, you want to date somebody else, you want to have a different career, you know, go for it. But don't expect anything in return, you know. Face the consequences, that's all. But for my part, I, I want to say that uh, Neelam, you neither the first or the last girl or a human being was going to have that problem. And I'm glad you stated what you did and stood up. And I stand along with you and I know how difficult it is for you to have spoken up here. I want to end, I know that the Deep Bhatt has a announcement for you, uh, but before we start, uh, I want to thank the panelists for doing such a magnificent job and
stimulating so much discussion. My special thanks to Rajan, uh, whom I invited to be my co-facilitator, but he very tactfully declined. He's been, he's the person who has really put this panel together, so he deserves a special hand. And I want to end uh, my part, my contribution to this with a story. When people are talking about sex, how can a psychiatrist resist? saying something, especially a story. It's about little Johnny. Little Johnny came home, he was doing a project for school. Asked his grandmother, where do children come from? And grandmother said, oh, uh, Johnny, uh, children uh, are brought by a stork. A stork comes and brings a child and leaves the child early in the morning right outside the home and the mommy discovers the baby. And Johnny, not very satisfied with that explanation, went to his mother and said to his mother, Mommy, where do children come from? Said, Mommy said, Johnny, it is like this. Some day early in the morning, daddy goes to the field and he discovers a little basket under the tree and brings the basket home and the basket is a baby. Johnny was still not satisfied with that explanation. So he asked his sister. Sister, where do children come from? She said, it's like this, it's very simple. Mommy goes to the hospital, a doctor comes to see her and in his little black there is a baby. And the doctor gives the baby to mommy and mommy brings the baby home. Johnny was doing, of course, a project for a school class on sex education. So in the essay on sex education, he wrote, in my family for three generations, no child has been born through a process of normal heterosexual relationship. <laughs> Thank you all very much and thank you for such wonderful participation. Hold on a second. There is an announcement. Please, uh, please visit the exhibits, uh, exhibitors. Uh, they would like you to come over there, buy the things, and photograph 6 p.m. sharp. What happened at the end of this day? Deviated from. So he stood up. So he said that he wanted to go Scary. <laughs> Trying to see this. How long you've used it?